appreciate that. <clears throat> we left off in uh, well, two weeks ago, uh, our last class meeting in Acts chapter 7. We got down about verse 16, and we're talking about <clears throat> the defense that Stephen is making before the Sanhedrin. And uh, I believe we mentioned that this is the, lo the, the longest speech uh, in the New Testament. And the accusations that were made against him, uh, we looked at that toward the end of chapter 6. Just to look at that just real quick so we get into the, his defense itself. They, uh, the different ones that brought the charges against him said in verse um, 11, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They stirred up the people there in verse 12. They caught him, brought him before the council, the Sanhedrin, in verse 13. They set up false witnesses which said, this man ceases not to speak blasphem blasphemous words against this holy place, the temple, and the law. We've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. So <clears throat> they were doing anything they could to... Uh, uh, get Stephen, I guess would say, and to uh, bring these charges against him. And he did speak uh, about the Christ and, of course, the things that were going to take place uh, or that were taking place and will take place under the Christian dispensation. But, of course, as always, just like the, uh, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the different ones that uh, tricked Jesus, the, the, the whole thing was to embellish what was said, to, to say things, to put it in a different context than what he was saying. And, uh, of course, uh, they, they asked him, what do you say about this? And so we got into this a little bit uh, two weeks ago about his defense. His defense, he goes all the way back to Abraham and talks about, uh, of course, Abraham and Moses, two of the greats that the uh, Jews put a lot of stock in, uh, as we mentioned uh, before. He went all the way back to Abraham, period of uh, from 1900 years, well, about 1900 years from Abraham up to Christ, uh, giving a little bit of a capsule of the history of the Jewish people. And what he's trying to do is to show that they've always had a history of rebellion or rejecting those that God sent to save them. Uh, and the, when he mentions Abraham or talks about Abraham, he was saying that Abraham was called even before he was circumcised. And the, I think the, uh, the issue there, what he was trying to say is that the, the gospel is for all. And uh, it will be for all. And uh, uh, eventually when we get to Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and the Gentile uh, world, and he was saying that the temple is not where God is dwelling. He doesn't, doesn't dwell in a building made with, with hands. And he gets into that quite a bit. And then, then he talks about uh, Joseph and talks about how he was uh, sold, how that he saved his people in that day and that Joseph is a type of Christ. Then he talks about Moses and he says that Moses, you rejected Moses as well. And of course, uh, they put a lot of stock into Moses and, and uh, of course the law and saying in effect that Moses was a type of Christ also. So you have Joseph being a type of Christ. You have Moses being a type of Christ. You have Abraham being called in uh, uh, the, the period of time before he was even circumcised. So he's, he's laying out uh, the, the history of the Jews and saying that they mistreated not just them, but the, the prophets that were sent to foretell about the Christ uh, and so forth. You killed the prophets. You rejected, um, you rejected, rejected the ones that God sent to you and so forth all leading up to the fact that now the present generation has rejected the Savior of the world. They rejected Christ, just like your forefathers uh, rejected uh, Joseph, Moses, the prophets uh, that were sent to, uh, to tell you the truth or to save you in various uh, periods of time. So that's kind of where we got to, I think, down about verse uh, 16. And I mentioned, I think, uh, two weeks ago that I wanted to read just a little bit, if I can, can read it. The print is still a little... On the floor, I, I just wasped. And he just flew... There he goes. So I wanted, I think. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
What was it, Bill? A wasp or hornet? It stepped on him there. Oh, oh man. Went on out. He's right here. All right. Dow's eyeing him up. Sorry to interrupt. You. I should have brought my wash spray tonight. I, I didn't think about that. One thing that I was not very alert to. Should have brought it. I just bought some the other day. If I can uh, read this part, um, and, if, and if I get to the point that I can't, I'll just, I'll just stop. <clears throat> but basically, uh, down about verse um, 16, again, he's, uh, he's reiterating uh, some of the history of the uh, Jewish people, and he gets gets down to after uh, uh, Joseph, uh, after Joseph is called upon to save his people and so forth, and the three score and fifteen souls. We talked about that because you've got a couple of different um, uh, versions. Where was it seventy five? Was it seventy? Was it sixty six? And we mentioned the fact that um, Stephen is using the Septuagint version, which uh, Jesus used, and others. And the plan it says there are three score and fifteen souls, uh, meaning seventy five. And uh, why that was not used all the way through, uh, some of the scholars said that they, they didn't understand that either. But then Jacob went down into Egypt, and in this statement, and he died. He and our fathers, and were carried over into Sychem or Shechem, uh, in the Old Testament. It, uh, and, and a lot of the um, the the proper names even people, places, and this sort of thing, you have a different spelling uh, from the Old Testament as opposed to the New Testament. And uh, even even the the father of Sychem or Shechem, Emmer, there in verse 16, E-M-M-O-R, in the Old Testament is Hamer, H-A-M-O-R. Uh, and he says that, and was carried over into Sychem or Shechem and laid in a sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emmer or Hamer, the father of Sychem or Shechem. Now this is kind of what we were talking about, uh, about some of the things that people say that Stephen made mistakes in. Now we've, we've talked about two or three of those, and I think we'll address those. We won't go back over, over those. Of course, there's not any mistakes, but there has to be an explanation for some of the things that are said here because uh, when we look at, and look at that, uh, it says that the, the phrase there, when Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers were carried into Sychem. It seems that that all of those, including Jacob, was carried into Sychem or Shechem to be buried. And we know that Jacob was not buried in Shechem, but where? The cave of Machpelah. Uh, and, of course, of course, we read about that. So how is it possible for that to occur? And I want to read a little bit about what McGarvey says about that. But let me just, just uh, tell you what uh, B.W. Johnson says. That Jacob was Jacob was buried at Hebron in the cave of Machpelah, Genesis 50 and verse 13. But the fathers were buried at Sychem or Shechem. We're, we're told in Joshua 24, 32, that Joseph was buried there, and Jewish tradition always affirmed that his brothers were buried there also. Jerome, who lived in the fourth century, said that their tombs were still to be seen. Jerome lived in Palestine. Uh, and then this uh, statement that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emmer for account of the purchase, uh, you go back to Genesis 33, 19, and also Joshua 24, 32. And here's the statement that he makes. The difficulty arises that Stephen, in the hurry of a rapid uh, speech, or, or the difficulty arises, that it was Jacob that made the purchase instead of Abraham. And here's what some say. Some say, I have supposed that Stephen... In the hurry of a rapid speech under exciting circumstances, by an oversight, used the name Abraham for Jacob. Others have thought that Abraham did make the purchase first and that it was repeated by Jacob. Neither of these views are probable. Had Stephen made a lapse, it would have been uh, corrected by Luke, who wrote under Paul's supervision, so as to give Stephen meaning. It is far more probable that some copyist, by oversight, first wrote Abraham for Jacob and that the manuscripts that have come down to us were made from that copy. There can hardly be a doubt that a man so learned in the scriptures as Stephen and making an inspired defense said Jacob. So what he's saying is that the copies, the copies that came down to us, probably somebody wrote Abraham rather than Jacob. Now, which, which to me is very likely, and McGarvey kind of makes the same argument. Let me see if I can see this enough to read it. 
In this sentence are two more of the mistakes, quote, uh, charged on Stephen, and there are much more like real mistakes than any of the preceding. He appears to say that Jacob was carried over into Shechem and buried, whereas he was buried at Hebron in the cave of Machpelah. And he, does, and he does plainly say that Abraham bought a tomb of the sons of Hamer in Shechem, whereas it was the tomb at Hebron, Hebron, which he bought, while it was Jacob who bought a piece of land at Shechem. It is difficult to imagine how Stephen could have made these two mistakes. For the, uh, and this is McGarvey uh, stating it, but he, he, he gets to uh, an explanation here in just a minute, so just bear with me just a minute. For the burial of Jacob is made so prominent in Genesis and was attended by a so remarkable a funeral pr uh, procession, including not only all the men of his uh, own posterity, but the elders of Egypt and a great company of Egyptian uh, horsemen, that the account of it must have been very familiar to every Israelite and very dear to his heart. So too, the purchase of the cave of Machpelah by Abraham, attended as it was by great sorrow for the loss of his beloved wife at an advanced age, and by the beautiful uh, courtesies which adorned both his own uh, conduct and that of his Hittite neighbors in making the transfer, was too prominent and interesting an event for a Jew of any intelligence in the scriptures such as Stephen certainly was to commit so great a blunder in regard to it. It is far more likely that, that, the, that some early copyist, so that he's getting to the point, knowing of Abraham's purchase and not remembering that Jacob also made one at Shechem have inadvertently uh, here inadvertently substituted the name Abraham where the name Jacob was originally written. We are constrained thereby, therefore by the natural probabilities of the case to conclude uh, with many eminent critics that the name Abraham is a clerical error and not a mistake made by Stephen. So that's, that's the explanation of McGarvey and uh, B.W. Johnson about uh, why Jacob was written there instead of uh, 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 Abraham, or Abraham instead of Jacob, as the case was. The statement made concerning the burial of Jacob admits another explanation. So let me let me read this briefly. I know it's kind of belaboring the point, but I, I, I think it's kind of interesting because a lot of people charge Stephen with making mistakes in his speech, which, of course, was not the case. As the two classes stand, uh, clauses stand in our version, notice that he died himself and our fathers, and they were carried over into Shechem. There could be no doubt that himself and fathers are common subjects of the one verb died, and that the pronoun they uh, before were carried refers to both alike. But it is not so in the original. So let me uh, just say what he says in the original, and I won't try to uh, read the Greek because, Israel, maybe you and Keith could, could do that, or Scott, since y'all are... Um, scholars from uh, going to prestigious schools, but I, I'm not going to try to read that. They said it's not so in the original. The construction is different. The verb rendered died is in the singular number, and it agrees only with this Greek word, himself. The plural substantive fathers is not the subject of that verb, but of the plural, whatever that Greek word is, understood. So the construction having been changed with the introduction of the plural subject uh, follows the plural verb, were carried. It belongs to the father. So it says the two clauses properly punctuated and with the ellipsis supplied, in other words, something has been left out, read thus, and he died, and then he's got a semicolon, and our fathers died and were carried over into Shechem. So you see how it's read? In other words, that he died, in other words, they're not saying that Jacob was carried over to Shechem, but the way it's written here in the King James seems to say that Jacob and the fathers died and were carried over to Shechem. Well, we know that that's not the case because, as we said, Jacob was buried in the cave of Machpelah along with Abraham and Sarah uh, and Isaac and Rebekah and, of course, uh, uh, Jacob and uh, Leah. So that's, that's and I, I won't go into the rest of that, but that it just gives kind of a little bit of an explanation as to how that is. So when you when you look at it in verse 16 or 15, 16, 
So Jacob went down into Egypt and died. Semicolon, in in the in the uh, in the King James there, and died. He, in other words, he died, and our fathers, in other words, our fathers died. So Jacob died, and our fathers died, and were carried over into Sechem. So it sounds like that both of them, both groups, Jacob and our fathers, were carried over into Sechem. I know that's not the case. So it depends on where you end the part about Jacob. So in uh, in verse fifteen, so Jacob went down into Egypt and died. So that's the end of that. Our fathers died and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulchre that Abraham bought for some of the money and so forth. So you see, you see how it would be written if it was punctuated a little differently. So uh, that, that was a point that I wanted to make. So some people would say, well, uh, J uh, Jacob made a mistake there. He didn't make a mistake. It's just the way it was translated. And sometimes, and, and you guys that have studied that, I guess translating it out of the Hebrew or out of the Greek Sometimes, and that, that's the reason we mentioned the other day, two or three weeks ago, you see a lot of uh, a, a lot of words in italics that even the translators in 1611 made to make the meaning a little bit clearer. And of course, they uh, they they made mention that that that's not that's not in the Greek, but uh, it's not in the original. But they supplied it in order for uh, for the meaning to be clear. And there's a lot of and a lot of verses. That there wouldn't have been any need to even uh, put add anything to it, but then there's some that would, uh, like for, for example, you you have the word "I am," "I am that I am," or you you have a uh, you have a question where, where Jesus would say "I," and then the the the, uh, the translators would would add the word "I am," "I am," so that that happens a lot in the uh, in the King James, and I'm sure others, others as well, but it's just it's just a um, more, I guess, of a clarification or stating it where it could be understood a little bit better. Lloyd, you had a thought on it. Well, <clears throat> Jacob's body was carried back after the bondage was over with. Wasn't he buried? Is that correct? He, he was, I meant Joseph. I meant Joseph. Yeah, Joseph. Yeah. Okay. Matter of fact, in <clears throat> well, in, in uh, it's in Genesis. <clears throat> But Genesis the, the 15. Father in the, uh, it says the other fathers. Who were the, who were the other fathers? Do you know who was oh, well, he's probably talking about Joseph's brothers, is what, what some think he's talking about. It, yeah. And a lot of the, the patriarchs or uh, the, the other brothers of Joseph, Jewish tradition says that they were buried where Joseph was buried in Shechem. The Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say where they were buried. But Jerome, Jerome talked about it and said that, that the, I guess some, at least some of the uh, graves were still present there in the fourth century, which would be in the 300s A.D. Some, you know, 250 or 280 years after they were buried. Long, well, longer than that, because it, it goes way back you know, even before that. And I was thinking about the, the the time of Christ, but that was that was way back, 16, 1800 years ago. Go ahead, Ezra. Sorry. Yes, sir. You're talking about the translation. Yeah, there's no such thing as a word for word translation. Right. Exactly. Right. But yes, sir, we can rest assured that uh, 
That's why you have that italicized. That we have the, we have the scriptures, and you can count on it. You can count and, on it. And, and particularly, and I, I thought about this. I was thinking about this the other day. E even if you can, even if you could surmise somehow or other that there is uh, quote mistake, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, based on the translation or based on what Stephen said or what anybody else said. It's interesting to me that that if you went back to the, the, the issues of salvation or the things where it's do or die, you got a uh, salvation or heaven, you know, uh, hell or heaven, where uh, we have to know what to do to be saved, what to do to stay saved, and so forth and so on. I can't find anything. Of course, I had I read I read the Bible through a lot, and I'm not a scholar. I don't claim to be a scholar, but all of those things are perfectly clear. And I know. Uh, Lord, one time, it had been uh, two or three years ago, Lord, we were talking about, wish that in some cases things had been made a little clearer. Yeah. You know, we, we talked about that. Well, the things, I got to, to looking at that, and the things that, the things that really matter from the standpoint of uh, what must I do to be saved, even though people might deny it, or even though they say, well, I know it says it, but I don't think it really means that, or anyhow, people... Uh, reason out repentance or confession or baptism or whatever it might be or the fact that you have to do anything or by grace are you saved you know like some people say the things that pertain to our salvation relative to what must I do to be saved and what must I do to remain saved is crystal clear yeah, just like objective. yeah in other words it's, it's, it's very clear when we get over to, um, and I, I made myself some notes uh, because I wanted to get into that when we got to, uh, down about verse 43 and talking about Molech and, um, and, and the things, the false gods and the things that, that were going on uh, even back, way back even in Leviticus and uh, where they set up idols to Baal, of course, and, and Molech and Ashtoreth and, and Milcom and uh, just on and on and on and Jupiter and uh, or some of those Diana, Dagon, Chemosh, and you just go on and on and on. And you kind of wonder how could the Israelites get it so wrong when God was so specific? Don't have any gods before me. Don't create anything that's in the heaven above, that's in earth beneath, that's in the sea, or anything else. You don't bow down to them. You don't. You don't. Uh, you don't have anything to do with them over and over and over, and in the last, and we'll talk about it later on, but in the last great speech that Moses made, which is almost the entire book of Deuteronomy, when he talks in Deuteronomy 4 and other passages, he laid it out specifically about uh, 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 reminding them about what went on in Exodus chapter 20 and giving the Ten Commandments. He reiterated, reiterated all of that, and uh, so... So when, he, when, they, when they got into the land of Canaan, what did they do? They did everything right opposite in, 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 in what they were supposed to do. And it's always been amazed to me as how they saw so many things in, in uh, Egypt there for 400 to 430 years and saw all the things that he did to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians, saw all of it, he fed them, he, he gave them water, all the things that they actually saw Moses do, even when he struck the rock. And all these things that, uh, or he, you know, when he spoke to the rock, when he struck the rock, or when he was told to speak to the rock. Uh, and, and all of these things that, uh, that they actually saw, and they got it so wrong all the way through. And then all the things that they, they set up idols to, and of course when Solomon comes along and, and, uh, and Solomon knew uh, uh, what God wanted him to do, and yet he turned to all these gods and so forth and so on and, and uh, set up all kind of things to uh, the, the thousand wives and concubines that he had and so forth. And you wonder why it was so explicit to them, and yet uh, you don't make any idols, you, you don't worship anything but me, I'm the only God, and uh, all the idols that they set up, uh, but he was very plain and very specific to those people, and even in our day. And I just wanted to point out, you know, the the, the, the situation with with the, the translation and some of those things, because the the things that you could say, well, that's a little bit of a mistake or whatever. 
the things that matter to us, this life or death or heaven or hell, uh, we can rely on it 100%. There, there's not anything, even, even though people say, well, here, here you said it's by grace. Here you said it's by faith. Here you said it's by baptism. Here he says it's by confession. Here he says it's this, that, or the other. And they fail to, uh, they fail to put it together the way they got uh, evidently int intended for us to put it together and to understand what he would have us to do. Charlie? All right, in Philippians 1, 7, it says, Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart in as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. There you go. Hard, hard to find a bad verse in the Bible, isn't it, Charlie? That's, that's a good one. Absolutely. But it depends on what Bible you read. Well, <laughs> I've got the one the apostles yeah. use. I've got King James. So. Yeah. That's what I got. Trying to figure out how the Israelites got it so wrong. God was so specific to them, but if you think about it, how did Adam and Eve get it so wrong? And there were Absolutely. only two people on the planet, yep. and he told them specifically one thing not to do. Yep. Just don't do that. That's right. Like that. Matter of fact, when we get there, I, I had that down as an example. That's a good example. Now, you, you, have, you have all these trees in the garden, and God said, you can have any of them you want except that one. That's about as specific and plain as you can get in it. Every one of them except that one. I kind of picture God pointing at every one, but that one don't don't touch don't touch that one. Don't look at that one. Yeah, in my head, that one probably actually looks significantly yep. different. Yep. That's why the Bible is from God because it tells the truth about absolutely man. Human so, nature hadn't changed much. Had it? it hadn't changed, and it tells the absolute truth about it. It hadn't changed much. Yeah. I just imagine Adam and Eve reminds me so much of the Bible. If you say don't touch that, yeah, you might as well just <laughs> yeah. pick up their hand and put it on. Yeah, like with a wet paint side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna have someone walk up and go, "Yeah, oh, this way." I, I remember when uh, when Keith was about two years old. Keith probably won't want me to tell this. He doesn't remember. He's probably two years old. But we had a pot over there in the corner by the TV, and he kind of wanted to get the dirt out of that pot and kind of throw it on Elaine's carpet. And so I said, "No, no, no," and I'd pop him maybe a time or two. No, 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 don't you do that. Well, I'd. Just kind of drawing up football plays or something, sitting in the chair there or something, and I'd see him kind of ease over to that pot, and then he would kind of he'd kind of look up. He'd see if I was watching him, you know, like that. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have told that chick. Go ahead, Keith. Man, that's the only thing you ever done wrong. Wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that was the case. And, uh, oh no, no, he had too much, Ronald. No, he, he doesn't. Listen, look at the flag, Ellie. There you go. Well, that verse 16, it'd be interesting to go back and see the Greek construction because parts of that is, is true on both uh, parts. Yeah. Uh, that, as you said, you know, Jacob uh, was buried in the tomb that Abraham bought, and the 12 brothers were buried at Shechem. So parts of those are true. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, how those are right. Yeah. Like we were talking about in one of our uh, classes at school, I found the internet. Uh, pictures of the tomb in Hebron, and at that tomb, they still got it preserved and all that in Israel when yeah. they visited. But there's Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, and Jacob and Leah, yeah, buried in Hebron, and the one that Abraham bought, yeah, you know, that's where he's buried. Yeah. He is buried in the tomb that Abraham bought, and then the brothers of Aaron are in the uh, one that Jacob himself bought. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see you know, you could rearrange that, or yeah, see how exactly, exactly. Good point. Well, when you, when you look at that, look at verse 16 again, uh, 15, I'm sorry. So notice how it's written, and you can, you can see how, how somebody looking at that, if they, knew, if they knew something about the English language, you would say that Jacob and our fathers were carried over to Shechem and buried. Because the way it's written there, so Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers. In other words, he and our fathers died and were carried over to Shechem. So it sounded like Jacob was part of that construction about being carried over to Shechem. So you can see how the, like Israel was talking about, where you, you translate it out of, one, uh, out of one language and how even the punctuation 
uh, makes a difference in the, the in the interpretation of the passage because we know, as he said, that uh, that Jacob went down in Egypt and died, but he was not carried over into Shechem. Then we know where he's buried because uh, the Bible tells us back in in Genesis was it Genesis fifty? 50 yeah. I was asking you a while ago about who the fathers were, but if you go up to verse twelve, it talks about the fathers were the brothers. Of yeah, brothers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good point, Lord. Yeah, so he's talking about uh, his brothers, and, and like like we said, a man that lived in the 4th century, uh, let me just read again what B.W. Johnson says, says Jer Jerome in the 4th century said that their tombs were still to be seen, and he lived in Palestine, so he makes that statement, or it's attributed to him anyway, that uh, talking about the fathers that the Lord was talking about, uh, his, his brothers. And then in verse uh, 17, so anything else or we can continue on? I know we get, I'm sorry to get bogged down on that, and I, w I wanted to cover more material tonight, but uh, I did it to myself. So. Uh, I am father. I mean, I follow the uh, Psalms 94, 20, It says, but the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock. Of my refuge. Absolutely, he is. He's he's the only one that counts. He's the only one that can uh, solve it. Psalm uh, Psalm forty six one says pretty much the same thing. He is our refuge and strength, very present help in time of trouble. And then in verses uh, seventeen and following through about verse uh, twenty one, uh, we we find that the time of the promise drew nigh, which. It says, God has sworn to Abraham, and the people grew, multiplied in Egypt, to another king arose, knew not Joseph. So he's, he, again, he's kind of recounting what happened. And, of course, we could go back to Exodus chapter chapter 1, particularly, uh, about that uh, situation, about the, the king that arose, and, of course, how he evil and treated the people and uh, had, had them work with hard bondage and so forth and so on. And he talks about that in verse 19. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, evil and treated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live, at which time Moses was born. During this time of um, upheaval and persecution and so forth, and of course we can go back, we won't go back and read that, but we all know the story, and go back to Exodus chapters 1 and 2 and read that. And of course the time of their, uh, the, the time of the promise, this was uh, the, the del deliverance, he's talking about the deliverance from Egypt, and in uh, and, and the 400 years or the 430 years, it's, it's mentioned both ways, and we, we talked about that too. From the time, from the call of Abraham would be 430 years, and about the time of, of Isaac's birth on would have been roughly 400 years. So that's where the, the discrepancy is in the 400 as opposed to the 430 years, which both are mentioned uh, in Scripture. So... Uh, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, there in verse 22, and was mighty in words and deeds. Uh, listen, uh, let me get somebody to read that for us. Uh, let's see. Bo, read um, 22 through 25, and Wayne, read 26 through 29, and that's, that's kind of a, a, a particular uh, <clears throat> section that, that makes a point. <clears throat> Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. For he was born when he was full, forty years old, and it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he took him and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. So he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand had delivered him. <clears throat> the next day he appeared to them as they were fighting. And God reconciled and said, Men, your brethren, why do you wrong my brother? But he who did this neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made your ruler a judge of this? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Gideon, where he had two sons. Okay, thank you guys. So it talks about Moses learned. He was. Uh, reared as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and uh, this is mentioned also in Hebrews eleven twenty four. 
he would be educated in all the accomplishments of his time. And uh, B.W. Johnson says that we know from the, the researchers of the Egypt, Egyptologist that, the period of Moses, and that in the period of Moses, there were great universities for the education of all who were expected to engage in public employments. And then in verses 23 to 29, uh, you go back and read particularly the account there about where he killed the Egyptian, uh, Exodus 2, 11 through 15, and, uh, and observe the point that Stephen is making, that Israel, that Israel rejected Moses as a judge and a ruler. In other words, who made you a judge or a ruler over us? So it even started right then, and he, then even after everything that he did and getting them out of Egyptian bondage, what did they do? They get out. You brought us out here to kill us all with hunger. You brought us out here to kill us all with thirst. We're going, we're, we're going to go back into Egypt. At least we had the uh, melons and garlic and leeks. and we, At least we have something to eat. Here we're starving to death. And even after God provided a manna, they weren't satisfied. Then he provided a quail. They still weren't satisfied. Uh, these people were never satisfied with anything that, uh, that God did for them. But the point that he's making uh, here, the point that Stephen's making, leading up to their rejection of Christ, is that Israel rejected Moses as a ruler and judge, as was uh, Joseph rejected, and as they themselves, the ones he's addressing, rejected Jesus. Yet God chose Joseph and Moses to be their saviors and rulers, just like he's, he, he's talking about Christ in this day being, being the savior and being the ruler, uh, of course, uh, when we get to the end of it, uh, when he accused them of killing him, crucifying the, the, the Son of God, of course, they didn't, they didn't take too kind of to that. They were, they were pricked in the heart, you know, kind of like Acts 2, but it was a different, a different pricking and a different, uh, different outcome, of course. Charlie, do you have something you want to... Well, in Psalms 89, 18, it says, For the Lord is our defense. And the Holy One of Israel is our King. He certainly is. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, isn't he? Good point. And then verses 30 to 34. Uh, let's see. Scott, do you care to read that one? Verse 30 to 34. 30 to 34? Yeah, 30 through 34, if you would. And when forty years were expired, they appeared to him in the, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, and an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near. To it, they held it, and voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled, and thus not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet from the place where thou standest, this holy ground. I have seen, I have, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come there, and heard their groaning, and and come down to the deliver, come down to deliver them, and now come. I will send thee into Egypt. All right. Thank you, Scott. 
If we go back to the event, we won't go back to read all of this, but the event that he's talking about is described in Exodus 3 where um, Moses was keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, uh, Exodus 3 and verse 1. An angel appeared to him. Uh, he was amazed that this is the burning bush incident where uh, the, uh, the flame of the fire was in the midst of the bush and, um, and the, the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. So uh, he was wondering about that, of course. The Lord uh, spoke to him or uh, uh, and called him out of the, the midst of the bush and, and so forth. And then he told him that the place that, uh, is, is, that you're standing is holy ground. And he talks about being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's seen the affliction of his people there in verse uh, 7, Exodus uh, 3. I'm come down to deliver them. I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, verse 10 of Exodus 3, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So this is what Stephen is uh, relating uh, to these people uh, at this particular uh, point. So, so that was uh, verses 30 to 34, the, the burning bush incident that he's recalling or, or stating. And then uh, verse 35 to 43 Let's see. Now, did, I, did I have you to read a while ago? I don't think I did. did, I? did I? Read, read uh, 35 to 43 uh, for us, now, if we have enough time. Yeah. This Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is this is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel <coughs> that appeared to him in the bush? He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness forty years? This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise, raise up for you a prophet like a man from your brethren, whom you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected, and in their hearts they turned back to saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf and a calf in those days, offered sacrifice to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god, Graham, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond that. All right. Thank you, Dale. We'll take up there about verse uh, 35 next week, and uh, then get on through uh, uh, Acts chapter 7, I think, uh, during class next week. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your participation.